Welcome back Titans. Today we are talking about sepsis. We're going to talk about some definitions, what you can expect to find during your patient assessment, how we should be treating these patients, who are most at risk, and everything else involved. So uh, sepsis is a very lethal uh, dysfunction in the body system that if treated appropriately and quickly, hopefully we can increase uh, patient survivability and decrease the mortality rate in these patients. 1.7 million Americans are diagnosed with sepsis each year. And if it goes untreated, it can lead to obviously death. So one, uh, let's talk about the three main uh, definitions that you'll hear terminology you hear when people are talking about sepsis. So there's septicemia, the generalized term for sepsis, and then septic shock. So what is septicemia? So septicemia is a generalized infection in the bloodstream. These are microorganisms that through infection make its way into your bloodstream. People all this also call this blood poisoning. So obviously, anytime you have a byproduct of a microorganism, anything bad in your bloodstream, it's going to cause dysfunction to your tissues and cells and organs and everything else, and your body's going to react to it. So we want to identify this and get these patients help as quickly as possible. What is sepsis? So the definition of sepsis in our Nancy Caroline book um, defines it as a pathological state usually in a febrile patient resulting from the invading microorganisms or their poisonous products in the bloodstream. That's what our little green dots are here in our bloodstream with our red blood cells and capillaries and everything else. <clears throat> and then we have septic shock. Well, we know that um, shock is an inadequate perfusion of tissues and cells and everything else um, based on the dilation of the vasculature in the system. So uh, septic shock is actually going to be part of the umbrella of distributive shock. And we'll get a little bit more into that later. But those are the three definitions. Let's move on to who is at risk. So who is most at risk for um, sepsis and septic shock and everything else? So patients that are greater than 65 years old, under one year, or any patient that has a immune deficiency disorder or a weakened immune system, and also those with diabetes. So let's talk about the assessment of our patient. So when you're assessing your patient and you think that they may or may not have sepsis, obviously you know, we know that there's a probability of a site of infection. Where can this infection start? It can start in the kidneys, the liver, uh, pulmonary in your lungs. It can also start at a wound site. Um, say you have a geriatric patient that doesn't move around a lot and they uh, develop decubitus ulcers, it could be from a number of different things. So is there a site of infection? That's number one. When you look, when you perform an assessment of a wound, you know, we're doing our OPQRST, our sample, we're doing a head to toe, all that on our patients. Does the site look infected? Is it red and nasty? Or this, is this patient already on antibiotics is a good question to ask during your sample history. Um, do they have a history of infections? Um, have they recently been to the hospital and received a diagnosis of, say, like pneumonia or something? This could key you into your site of infection for that patient. A lot of the times, patients are going to have fevers or be febrile. So we know our body's natural uh, response is homeostasis, its ability to maintain a normal environment in the body. So what happens when we have a fever or we have an infection, rather? We develop a fever. We're raising our, our body's temperature to try to create an uninhabitable environment for those microorganisms. So they, it kills them off so they cannot survive. Um, then we're going to get on to the respirations, their heart rate, and all that fun stuff. So, <clears throat> so let's talk about the stages of sepsis. So stage one of sepsis is sepsis itself. This is the site of infection. This is where the actual infection begins at the site. Like we said, the decubitus ulcers or the pneumonia, kidney infection, any of those different things. During the initial stages of sepsis, um, our body's natural reaction is going to be increasing our temperature and raising our heart rate a little bit. Blood pressure could remain about the same, and then respirations and in and tidal CO2 are going to vary. Um, if we increase our respirations, obviously, the higher the respirations, we're going to drop our entitled CO2 down a little bit. So we're going to want to put these patients on entitled CO2. And if they're hypoxic, obviously, we're putting them on supplemental oxygen. Level of consciousness during the first stage, 
of infection is probably about the same. We're always doing our GCS scale and, and identifying our patient's GCS. So we can track trend to see if they are uh, maintaining that Glasgow Coma score or if they're trending in a downward and having probably altered mental status, confusion, those sorts of things. <clears throat> Stage two, if it goes untreated, now we're getting into severe sepsis. So like we said with the, with the uh, vital signs, temperature's still up, heart rate's still up. Now, because we said it was distributive shock and we're gonna have vasodilation, our blood pressure is going to start to go down a little bit. Our respirations are going to continue to stay up because we're still trying to compensate, especially now that we have vasodilation. End titles continuing to drop because our respirations are up. And then level of consciousness could be, could be the same. It may be a little bit different. Patients are feeling weak. If they're hypoxic or their blood pressure starts to get too low, they may have a little bit of altered mental status. Left untreated we're going to go into stage three, which is septic shock, part of the distributive shock class because of the uh, vasodilation. So now we're looking at our vital signs of our patient. We know that shock is the inability to adequately maintain perfusion in our cells and tissues and organs because of that, uh, the distributive shock being vasodilating. So our heart rate is still gonna be up. We still may have a fever. Um, if you are checking your patient's skin temp and condition and all that fun stuff, a good question to ask them is if they're taking uh, any Tylenol or Motrin for the fever because it may mask some of those uh, uh, signs. Blood pressure is going to continue to drop. Hopefully, we're not getting less than 90. Systolic, um, that's going to be a benchmark for us. Respirations are going to continue to go up. End title is going to go down, obviously, because respirations are up and then level of consciousness is going to start declining. Um, check your local jurisdiction, your, your medical director policies and procedures. Maybe you are using Sears criteria, maybe you're taking lactic acid tests in the field, whatever your protocol may be for your sepsis patients, because the vital signs can vary a little bit. So how are we going to treat our patients? So what's our treatment like? Obviously, we have a high temp, high heart rate, our BP is dropping, we're going to try to fix that. Respirations, hopefully we put them on supplemental oxygen if they are um, hypoxic or have some sort of dyspnea, and then our end tidal CO2. So, how are we going to treat these patients? So, a lot of the, a lot of the protocols that you'll find will say that we need to start delivering a, a high volume of fluids to these patients. Some protocols say at least start a liter bag of crystalloid solution. Um, others indicate that you should be giving 30 milliliters per kilogram. So that may not sound like a lot, but let's take our 90 kilogram patient. If we're going to multiply that by 30 mLs, that's, and this is the first three hours, that's going to equal 2,700 milliliters. Almost three liters of fluids in the first three hours that this patient is going to probably receive. Another thing to consider is if you have a uh, your protocol may be call for norepi, a norepi drip to maintain um, vasoconstriction and uh, increase your patient's blood pressure if they're unresponsive to fluids. Um, we need to get these patients to a hospital. <clears throat> Once they are at the hospital, um, a lot of the times they'll continue to get the crystalloid solutions. They may give um, some presser agent um, per the physician's orders. Um, they're going to draw cultures. Um, before receiving antibiotics. And these patients are very, very sick, so they're probably going to be in the hospital for a short period of time to a long period of time, depending on how they are. They're probably also gonna take uh, some lab values for lactic acid. So quick recap, sepsis, pathological state, usually in a febrile patient, invading microorganisms or poisonous products in the bloodstream. Left untreated, they're going to get progressively worse and can suffer from septic shock and or death. We know our septic shock is distributive in nature, so we're gonna vasodilate. It's going to alter our vital signs. So the adequate um, assessment of our patients, identification of what's going on with them and providing our treatment, either fluids or a presser, depending on your local protocol, is going to be, is going to be very important for these patients. Um, always do your cross-check on your medications. Hope this helps. See you next time.